a warm welcome to our final fifth session. Uh, I see that no one's tired, so we listen to uh, Prime Minister Kalas. Uh, we're full of energy, and of course, the discussions have kept us widely awake. Uh, we've had some great interventions over the day, and we will have a sort of grand finale about uh, the question of the future of Russia, which is not much being discussed in the media. But before I go into that, um, uh, a little birdie came up to me and told me something that you can not even find out on Bellingcat, and that is that Christo Gross's birthday is today. So, <laughs> So, Krista, I hope the embarrassment was very short. <laughs> uh, so, lots to discuss. Uh, I hand it over to Marina Davidova, who's a theater critic, and she will lead the session. So, please, Marina, take over. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, um, everybody is exhausted, so let us remember about time limits. And me, first of all, of course. Uh, so I, I, I'd like first, I'd, I'd like just to, as a citizen of Russian Federation, uh, I'd like to say that uh, not only me, but a lot of my friends and colleagues, uh, we stand with Ukraine, we are supporting Ukrainian people, and we really, we're experiencing their tragedy as our own. It's obvious, but at the same time, it's very important for me to, to say it. And, uh, um, I think that this, um, the participants of this last session uh, have to answer maybe the most difficult and the most uh, tragic uh, question. Uh, um, because you know, all the people I had a chance to communicate over this uh, two and a half months, they, um, they repeated in unison that they don't see good scenario for Russia. Like each of them offered um, a kind of his own, the worst case scenario. Uh, and for Ukraine, uh, despite all of its tragedy, these good scenarios are more or less visible, but not for Russia. So, uh, okay, let us, I, 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 maybe later, I will give you my own vision of this more or less good scenario. But now, uh, I'd like our two brilliant speakers to start the, the, the conversation. And we, um, shortly, we uh, communicated before and decided that uh, Stefan Holtz, uh, he will, Morally speak about the reasons why all this bullshit ha happened in Russia, and uh, Maxim Trudalubov, uh, he will uh, speak more about our future. So, uh, my very simple questions to Stefan are: the first thing is, uh, what do you think? Why were we so blind? Because uh, from uh, nowadays perspective, when I think about what was happening, not uh, uh, only in 2022, but two years ago, for example, it was so many signs that uh, Putin and his inner circle uh, are preparing for, for, for the war. Uh, you know, because when a president spends his vacation, not with his uh, family, with his wife or children, or even a lover, but in Minister of Defense, Minister of Defense in Taiga, you know? You, we, we read all this news in our uh, newspapers and so on, so on, and uh, me personally, and so I didn't care. Okay, he's a strange person. He spent <laughs> with this Minister of Defense in Taiga his vacation, so what? And the um, second question was really uh, I'm interested in, how did it happen that in a country where 
like until recently, uh, there's alternative sources of information could be found. And even now, it's possible to find them. So it was possible to fool tens of millions of people and make them believe that uh, com completely incredible picture about Nazi Ukraine, which was specially created by the West as anti-Russia. It's such a special mythological reality, and millions of people really believe in these uh, things. How it happened? Uh, and if you can answer these questions, I, I, I'll, I'll be really happy. Micro. No. So maybe you have used two two micros. How about this? this is, is this better? It's Excellent. better. It'll be a stereophonic experience. So um, I think as people in uh, Ukraine will tell you, they did know it was going to happen. So who who was that didn't know? And one answer, a simple answer, is that capacities create. Well, capacities create intentions, but create, capacities also create diagnoses. Uh, diagnosis. And if you are the European Union, without much uh, military power, you're not going to see a problem that can only be solved by a military response. I, I just have to, I don't know if it's an apology, but I think the reason I am on this panel, even though there are many people in the room who know more about Russia than I do, is that Putin has Come to, uh, come to the, uh, I don't say the rescue, but he has reminded Europe that it is still an American protectorate. And this is a, a something that when Germany woke up on February 24th and realized it didn't have an army, before that it wasn't aware. So I think partly there is a, a wishful thinking uh, that's going on. As Yvonne said, the, the project of Europe is a commercial one. Uh, there's no problem. No, uh, po uh, military power is not a solution, and so on. So that's part of it. About, the, well, maybe a deeper question, about why are people in Russia believing in these stories? Yeah. Now, I think we need to distinguish between stories like the Bucha massacre was staged, which is, uh, versus, you know, the West has hostile intentions. Those might be two different things. But in either case, and again, uh, just a preliminary remark here, I think this panel stands out today among all the panels because it's actually asking a question about a single country and what's happening inside mm -hmm. it, which I find refreshing, as opposed to talking about uh, what the European Union is supposed to do after the war is over when everybody knows the war is not going to be over anytime soon. So how to think about... Um, this continue the the what looks like in the polls uh, increasing sometimes support for the war. Now sometimes it's part of it is just conformism, keeping your head down, not wanting to attract attention. It's certainly not just lack of alternative sources of information. I think a good clue to this is that the Russian community, some of the Russians in Berlin, living in Berlin. Yeah. who have alternative sources of information, right. still believe still that believe. the United States is using Ukraine to destroy the, the Russia. Um, so, and it's, that's probably not fear. So, I mean, in a way, uh, rallying around the flag or being feeling like you're being attacked in some way makes you uh, identify. But what's not easy to explain and I'd like to hear more from others about this, is a kind of intensification of this patriotic uh, effect by which, in which parents will call their children traitors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of inverse Pavlik Morozov syndrome where there's a, and that, that is not natural. I mean, rallying around your country when it's in a war is natural, but calling your children traitors is not. So this is, uh, uh, a kind of intensity of identification that comes from some deeper place. Now, I'll make a few remarks about what is a belief, this is very abstract, as opposed to something that would be explained to you by, a, 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 by someone who lives in Russia. But there is a way in which um, 
In a situation like this, statements of fact dissolve into declarations of membership. That is, when you're saying this is true, that you know the Russians are protecting civilians or the Russians have never killed any civilians and this kind of absurdity, you're not really saying that it's true. You're saying this is what side I'm on. This is the allegiance I'm swearing by. And in a sense, and I'm interested in this, but the way in which there are clues that there is some, there is some disturbance under the surface in Russia going on. So there are two aspects of that that might lead us in that direction. One is the notion that it, I cannot show loyalty to my government by repeating something the government says that is obviously true, because that's, anybody can say that. But if I repeat something that's obviously false or absurd, then I'm showing loyalty. And I think that suggests that there's something, there's some awareness that this is maybe not completely true, but you say it anyway as a way of standing by your side. Or an, another way to put this is what's known as the doctrine of the evil tongue. The doctrine of the evil tongue says, what my enemies are saying may be true, but I'm gonna deny it because it will be used by my enemies against my group. So that also suggests that it isn't really belief. It's, there's some sense of you know, unease underneath it. And um, so I think that's, there's a possibility that this, even the strong kind of crazy affirmations of uh, obvious falsehoods may contain within it uh, some kind of doubt. And if I could just add, there are, three, there are three or four things I'd like to know about what's actually happening in Russia, as opposed to what, you know, when we talk about the future of the EU or the future of Central Europe or the ball. In the case of Russia, it's what's happening now. I, I, the future is, of course, unknown. The future of the war is unknown. But what, what do we see so far? What's happening? I mean, for example, you have an embargo. Embargoes produce smuggling. What's happening with the smuggling regime? This is something that's going on. Where, what's happening? What's happening inside the security services? What's happening with the sniping inside the security services? What's happening, uh, of course, in families, as I said, in, in business? And this is uh, the reason, uh, one, of this, uh, one of the reasons it's important to look at this is because the kind of scars that can be left in Russian society caused by an event like this. There are many sources of them, but one of them comes from the fact that if you have a highly repressive regime that punishes you for deviating from the official version of reality, mm -hmm. you're creating an incentive for people to turn you over to the police. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is a paradox about tyrannical societies that tyrannical societies give individuals a kind of power that they can never have in a democratic system. I can, in a democratic system, I can submit my secret ballot about the candidate I want to vote for, but that's a very weak power. But in a tyrannical regime, I can submit an anonymous denunciation of somebody uh, for having badmouthed Putin or used the word war or whatever it is, and you would expect that to be happening. Is it happening? And uh, if so, what are the kind of consequences of that. So. Thank you. And uh, um, now, Maxim, I, I, I have to answer even more difficult question is uh, what's really future for, 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 for Russia. And um, actually, um, how it's possible to win this like I would say, an informational war, because it, it, and is it possible to win it? Because, and uh, there is another, even more general question: How do we live in a, a like post-truth reality, post-truth world? Because Russia is uh, maybe the best example of this post-truth world, and so on. So it's for me, it's a key questions uh, of today: uh, How to deal with? Uh, uh, all this Russian society, because for me, what's going on uh, in Russia at the moment is a kind of new religious movement. 
And can we uh, just oppose something to this new religious movement? The, how to, to, to learn people uh, to, to, to think uh, critically, to, to, to see the reality, but not the mythos instead of reality. Mm, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, hi. Um, so I'll, I'll try and talk first about an, an, an image of Russia, a future Russia that I myself like. We don't know what kind of future we're going to face uh, in actual reality, so uh, I'll be as fanciful as, as possible. Um, um, I think that what... So it's kind of thinking in, in a different way. It, it, it's not that this is a likely future, but I think this is the kind of future that we all need and Russians do need uh, themselves, although many of them don't know it. <laughs> um, so basically, it would include um, independent institutions. And first and foremost, it would be uh, the first institution created in this hypothetical new Russia, which would be a court um, that would be able to uh, make rulings, judgments on the dealings of uh, the Russian government. None, none, nothing of the kind ever happened in Russian history. And Russia has very little experience with uh, any independence of any kind, particularly institutional. Uh, so <clears throat> it's highly unlikely. But <clears throat> uh, without it, to me, if, if you ask me, Russia does not really have a future that I want to see myself. So th th there should be a court like this. There should be institutions put in place that would protect citizens from the government, uh, from the state. And this hypothetical trial would uh, not just include um, uh, crimes being committed now in Ukraine, but it would in some way look at what the Russian state has been doing for the past, well, at least 100 years. Uh, because what is Ukraine of today is a reenactment of <clears throat> uh, the crimes of the Russian state that it has been uh, committing since time immemorial. But if we look, for the sake of brevity, look at the Soviet period of uh, Russia's history, we'll see uh, summary executions, trials, uh, non-judiciary non killings, um, deportations, um, famine artificially caused, um, numerous occupations um, with, uh, about which countries uh, that surround Russia know very well. And it's, uh, Karolina pointed that out, uh, um, in many in uh, Europe, particularly the Baltic states, Poland obviously, and others now go through those memories once again as if they'd just been happening yesterday. So all of this has to be included in this trial, in this reckoning with the past that Russia, a Russian society, managed to avoid. Um, and that was partly Russian society's own fault and partly, obviously, policies uh, by uh, the current rulers. Um, and who substitute, essentially what they did, they substituted the memory of the, the myth of the uh, great patriotic war, which is Russia's part of the Second World War. They substituted this heroic uh, picture. Uh, they put it instead of the, the actual uh, tragic past that Russia has to reckon with. So it, it kind of created this uh, moral comfort zone, which provided um, the sense of belonging to, to being uh, on the right side of history for Russians for many years. It essentially served as a, almost like an identity. So Russia, in this utopian vision of a Russia, it, it has to go through its identity, go through its history. It has essentially um, almost become European. And uh, um, and just to conclude this part, I would say that if we look at what the current 
leaders been doing for the past, I don't know, 20 plus, 20 plus years. They've been systematically, consistently uh, getting rid, killing all those things that I've just described. Independent institutions, media, uh, organizations, NGOs, um, courts, obviously. Um, and if we look at uh, the, um, uh, this uh, George Steiner's text, uh, you know, idea of Europe, European idea of Europe, I think it's the five uh, points that uh, he has there. Uh, they've killed all the five. Uh, five points is uh, coffee houses, uh, European towns, cities being walkable, um, history, importance of memory in um, everyday life, uh, religious legacy, um, sort of a sense of, um, um, and, and number five, a sense of sort of a sunset, a feel of uh, going uh, sort of into crisis. So that, that's not me, that's him. And uh, what we see in Russia, that all those five have been meticulously killed. So that's the vision that likely won't happen. Um, although, I'm sure we need this kind of Russia. And if, so again, if we're looking from the other side and, and, and think, what kind of Russia will be needed? So this kind of Russia, I need this Russia. I don't know, maybe a couple other people too. Um, it's not really a popular idea. Uh, and there's no, con there's no constituency. And yeah, uh, the Russian state has just uh, closed uh, down and got rid of Memorial, the main civil society organization in Russia, which was devoted to this very thing, memory. Um, anyway, so what kind of, who needs what kind of Russia? Again, we don't know whether it will happen, but you know, if we look in the, at Europe's post-war history, we'll see post-crisis, post-war Germany, somebody needed it as an industrial powerhouse. Uh, with time, it, the West, you know, the Americans needed it as part of the West, so it was part of this complicated equation, bringing Germany back as part of the West, part of NATO, etc. In a similar vein, if you think about Russia, who needs it? Um, well, perhaps needs it as, a, as an energy source uh, and obviously the non-Western world <coughs> needs it. Um, and if the Western world's plan to wean itself off Russia as an energy source is, will be fulfilled, then non, the non-West will need Russia more. So we will have a weakened Russia that will be part of the, this situation with essentially China's uh, little energy helper. Um, this kind of future it perhaps is more likely, but it is, is not the kind of future most Russians would like to see. And um, the, one, the way to, to go in any, any way, uh, in any of those, and those are two, um, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going into a, a couple others I had. Um, we will need a, a generational change in Russia anyway. And a lot will depend on what kind of change it is going to be. Uh, people who are ruling Russia are about roughly about 70. People who make all the decisions, including the decision to invade Ukraine. Uh, they were born in the 1950s. Uh, in late 40s. Um, some are, were born in the, in the 1960s, but they're, they're mostly sort of second tier. So the first, the, the upper tier are people in the late 60s, 70. Uh, so this is a very particular kind of generation. It's not just generational, it's also the experience, the people who started their careers in the Soviet Union, the, many of them uh, are, come from uh, special agencies of various kinds, including, of course, the president himself. Um, so this is a very particular group. In Ukraine, their opponents are people 20 years, 25 years younger, with a very diff different experience. So this is a generational, it's a war of generations. 
But it's not just the war of generations between Russia, uh, Russian leadership and Ukrainian leadership, but also within Russia, because uh, the next generation, people who would be Zelensky's peers, Navalny is almost Zelensky's, Navalny is a bit older, a uh, year and a half older than Zelensky. Zelensky was born in uh, 1978, Navalny is 76. So um, this next generation of Russian leaders has been completely subjugated and lost any chance of, I personally think that I'm part of this generation myself, and uh, I personally think people born in the 70s and the 80s, I think that we are not, we are gonna, we'll have to skip the, uh, this chance of uh, helping uh, Mother Russia to become anything. So we'll uh, remain journalists, unfortunately, which most of the, uh, you know, activists, NGO people, uh, all kinds of people who used to be any, anybody in Russia of, you know, my generation, younger. They're all journalists now, essentially, media people, because uh, all the real projects in the real world, they have essentially turned into YouTube channels and uh, online media projects. So this is going nowhere. And um, um, probably the next, next generation will come, but I, I, can't, I can't really see that. So basically, I will conclude in, in, in saying that um, we will need to deal with a very difficult pressure anyway. And I, I think that um, this whole idea of imposing costs on Russia so far has not been really working because um, you, you essentially cannot impose costs on Putin uh, because he has this incredible ability to make others pay for his failures. He's full of failures. It's hard to name a single successful project in, in his, if he had to write a resume, he wouldn't be hired anywhere. Um, he, he failed almost on everything. Uh, wanted to demilitarize Ukraine, militarize Ukraine. He wanted to uh, push NATO back. He make sure NATO is closer to the Russian border. Et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he wanted to create new weaponry systems and everything uh, to promote Russia as the best, most important trader in arms and everything. It's all failures. But somehow he makes others pay, including first and foremost the Russian citizens themselves. So, and this will continue for a while until it just goes down, crushing down, uh, because the calculus is different as a democratic. So democratic societies. Uh, politicians pay for their failures, more or less. <laughs> well, more often than in, in places like Russia. But uh, in Russia, they don't, until they either die or it's so crushing that they basically... So, um, which means probably that we will have to see uh, a, a, this agony for quite a protracted, protracted uh, period of time and we will have to deal with uh, Russia's energy war, Russia's policies that have to do with uh, refugees' migration, um, Russia's um, apparently idea to somehow use its grain exports and other food exports to, again, push uh, the West. So he will continue using any, anything that's in his disposal to fight, to try to just make life miserable to anyone who will, uh, you know, who he, he could. So uh, that's probably not the brightest message, but um, real change will only come from inside Russia. I don't believe it could be imposed simply because to make this utopian European Russia possible, Russia will have to be defeated militarily completely. And that's, I'm not sure, is real. Um, um, so it's maybe the other one is Russia of energy as an energy source and, and, a, and a source of energy policies and wars is more real, but we will have, we, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to almost anything that uh, 
has to do with Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maxim. Uh, actually, I'm supposed to ask questions here, but uh, let me make a short statement as a continuation of what Maxim, uh, like Maxim's speech, because. Uh, really, I, um, at some point, I started to ask myself, uh, what is Russia? Uh, does Russia equal to its uh, geographical borders and its criminal authorities and so on and so on? And what to do with this million of people, million of people, um, according to the latest estimates, like about four million of people which left Russia uh, during this last and a half months. Because it's not, they are not just immigrants and refugees, but it, they are the most creative part of Russian society. And you cannot imagine how many like startups, initiatives already um, appeared uh, uh, in the internet. And uh, they like, like a pure, like mushrooms uh, after the rain. And uh, uh, like some days ago, I was informed that there is like a special relocation school with uh, uh, courses for, of Latvian, Armenian, Turkish, and Azerbaijan languages for Russian immigrants. And at the same time, there are courses for, on Russian history. Or uh, another initiative, which I was so much impressed, some uh, Russian uh, like IT um, specialists together with some Russian artists and directors, they are creating right now the kind of uh, the city of, uh, of the city of the sun of Tamaza Campanella, but in, on the internet. And uh, that's, it's a very special state with its uh, citizenship, with its manifesto constitution. And they are uh, talking to each other, to, trying to understand uh, who will be the citizens of this uh, country. And um, um, as I noticed, uh, mostly these immigrants, they don't believe in no normal vertical uh, hierarchy, but they believe in horizontally structured uh, society. And actually, I think that uh, all the other waves of Russian immigration, you know there were a lo lot of waves of Russian immigration, they never had si such te technologies, such um, opportunities for communication, uh, uh, like uh, uh, nowadays uh, immigration has. And so, uh, it's, it means that it's a chance uh, to exist as a unified mental and cultural space. And this virtual space uh, exists not just outside, but above uh, all the borders. I even sometimes I call it for myself, like Russia in the cloud. And this Russia in the cloud, to my mind, will be a very important new actor uh, of of um, of the political reality, I believe in it. Maybe it's again a bit uh, too utopical, but um, um, I think that um, we we have to 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 think in this utopical way if you, we want to not to go to deadline, but uh, no, if we want to to find the way out. Uh, okay, but uh, let us um, come back to um, all the questions which we touched in the very beginning. And uh, I, I see that uh, there are some speakers already already talk something. Mm -hmm. I maybe add to the, your last point. We have still a huge Syrian cloud, you know, the best and the brightest of that country, which social fabric was completely destroyed. It's somewhere out there, and no one is dealing with them. Mm -hmm. And Assad is still in power. Uh, but to pick up on Maxim's point, uh, if we are here for the long run, as Olivia said, with this ground zero of transition warfare, as you perfectly put it. And if we, what you emphasized, have now new religious post-truth utopian mythological regime or space within still an empire mindset, uh, and we have this huge diaspora which consists of this creativity, media, NGOs, all the people that we know. Uh, what I see, there is no dialogue of this 
new diaspora which fled Putin and the action that happened with Ukrainians. And I think maintaining this kind of uh, conversation in times of war is very important. We heard the points from our Ukrainian uh, friends that, of course, we can talk about big concept of reconciliation, forgiveness, uh, you know, reasons of the conflict. Uh, but it's not, you know, Putin, court, Hague, new court, court in Moscow that Maxim dreams of. But it's, you know, human to human connections. Mm -hmm. And if you have, for example, a network that both Maxim and I are inside, this is network of so-called School of Political Studies under the auspices of Council of Europe, which had school in Moscow, which was claimed foreign agent and was bashed from Russia a long time ago. If you have this school in Ukraine, if you have some kind of space for talk, for you know, understanding of people who are not pro-Putin mm -hmm. and who are there, I think this is very important to foster in this kind of times for any future. Because if you cut all ties, and as Ivan said, in wars and in actor as Russia is, you will engage in talks with the dictator one way or the other or not, I don't know, maybe the nukes will fall and we will not be here anymore. But I think that we need then to engage in people's dialogue also in some parallel instances in this huge diaspora space around both Russia and Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, but, but the thing is that uh, uh, these uh, new uh, um, connection possibilities, they give up, um, like opportunity to, to because uh, I, I imagine this new, new map of the world, uh, like an archipelago of different islands, and some of these islands are still in Russia, and, maybe, uh, and then maybe yeah, there's yeah, in yeah. Ukraine, in, in Belarus, and other, other uh, countries as well. So, and, uh, uh, and of course, the idea is to involve these people from, from geographical Russia to all these um, activities, and communication, not, not to cut ourselves from them, but to, to uh, build the bridges to, 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 to Russia. We're, like, you know, no, no, not physically, but- if you're in Russia, if you build the bridge now, you can end up dead or in jail or in the front line in Donbas. So, you know, I understand why people fled Russia completely. Thank you very much. I, I want to ask slightly different question. The first question is, how Putin sees the future of Russia? And this is not an interesting question because he's an old man. He knows that he's mortal. And he's also thinking about the future. And in my view, he also does not like Russia particularly in the way it is. So what I'm afraid of, and this is talking about identity, he believes that the only real Russia that basically is worth respecting is Russia in war. This is why this absolutely fascination with the World War II, this is why you have basically all this reenacting of war, because basically <coughs> he knows about Russian corruption enough that he's not so misinformed that we're trying to do it. So the only way of modernizing Russia is Russia, which is always in a kind of a war. It could be a low intensity war. It could be kind of a much more. But this is the way he believes that Russia can protect itself. And this is interesting from what? Uh, and one of the interesting stories, we tried to make jokes with this, but when basically President Putin was saying that like J.K. Rowling's, he was canceled and Russia was canceled, this is slightly more important than it looks like. This fear of a kind of a Western culture which is in decline in the way basically America was trying to protect from the Chinese virus during the COVID, he's very much afraid of the American virus which is going to destroy the cultural identity of Russia, civilizational identity and others. And so I'm, I'm saying this because then being in a war is not about simply winning. Being in a war is keeping the identity of the Russian state. So if Americans are afraid of a never-ending wars, President Putin believes that this is the only way to secure Russia when he does not trust his successor. He has seen one of his successors already. Uh, and basically, he is afraid that 
all others are going to betray Russia when he's not there. And I'm saying this because for me the real issue is two important things happened after this war which is going to make for the Russia, including the Russian diaspora, much more difficult to function when he's looking for a new identity. During the Cold War, Russian culture was mobilized by the West, even more weaponized by the West, to fight the Soviet regime. The story was Tolstoy was on the side of the West. Pushkin was on the side of the West. It was the Russian dissident community which was claiming their hours. Because of the nature of the Russian-Ukrainian war, because this is also the dissolution of the empire, because it is an identity war, suddenly, one of the things that is happening is that you have a big groups of Russian-speaking people who do not want to speak Russian anymore, at least publicly, for political reasons. Listen, this is different. Even during, after the Bolshevik Revolution, there was an interest in Russian language. Mayakovsky used to say, I'm going to learn language because Lenin speaks in it. Suddenly, Russian language, which is so central to the Russian identity, it is in crisis. I can see this even in Vienna. A lot of people who are going to speak with you in a bad English because then speaking Russian becomes a political statement. And secondly, what I discovered listening to people, suddenly you start to people and they're starting to telling you, I'm Russian, but I'm in fact uh, half Tatar, or I'm Buryatin, and so on and so on. So as a result of the war, you have kind of a strangely this type of other identities, because of course Russia is a multi-ethnic, multicultural community. And this is the interesting story. So for me, the question is, what kind of an identity you're going to build when World War II identity, I mean the victory against Nazism is not possible anymore because it was basically destroyed by the way uh, Putin was using denazification. You simply cannot speak about it anymore. The, the, I mean, the heroism of the Soviet people and the, what the Soviet people, not the Russian people, is there, but there is no next post-Putin leader who wants to have any respect who can go back to this. And then you have this kind of a Russian culture, Russian language attacked by people who share it. So for me, this is the biggest kind of a question that goes beyond the political regime simply. And of course, yeah, I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, uh, I also I'm thinking uh, uh, a lot about this uh, complex identity of many uh, Russian citizens, and one of the most. Uh, painful question for me why people from Buratia or Bashkiria or some other uh, like uh, small national regions of, of Russian Federation, they are supporting this crazy uh, Putin's idea about Russian world. Uh, what are for them this, this idea? So uh, maybe we we be able somehow to answer this question uh, as well. And uh, now I, I give the floor to Susanna. Yeah. Okay. You know, I came to Russia in in '91, and I stayed for 20 years. And uh, I remember the euphoria we had in '91 when uh, after the. Um, Coup uh, d'état, which was really uh, a bit of, um, of a strange story, uh, and I remember that we we were sure it would be a democratic Russia, and everybody told the Russians that now we have democracy, but nobody nobody said to them that democracy is something you have uh, to fight for every day in your life. So that was the first problem. The second problem was that the so-called Harvard boys came to Moscow and said, um, it, you liberate uh, your market and then everything will be okay. And that was the second 
uh, think that wasn't um, working, of course not. So uh, what happened uh, was that people were upset uh, with uh, what went on and people started to think that democracy was something which didn't help them, uh, which made their, their life much more difficult. Uh, that's what I want to say first. Second, I want to say, and uh, we, we never spoke about this, but Russians think of themselves as Europeans. Uh, till Vladivostok, you know it. I mean, uh, you go to Russia and everybody will say you, but we are U Europeans, we are not Asiatic. That's really important. Uh, and the third thing I wanted to say is that Russia always was unpredictable. And it is now, and I think that um, as terrible as the situation is now, and I have friends sitting in Moscow and, and, and crying all the, all the day because they are isolated, they can't leave, they can't speak with people and so on. But anyway, uh, there are people, and I think um, uh, we, have to, we have to see if, uh, for example, the, the so-called Sil Siloviki, it means the military, the, the secret service, and so on. Uh, it could be that somebody there uh, will realize that what Putin wants, and in my opinion, but that, that's just, I'm just speculating. I think he just wants um, the Soviet Union back. Uh, which means he wants the big Russia back, and the, the big Russia means with Ukraine, without Ukraine, he can't have his big Russia. So he will try in any, in any way to take Ukraine. And he can't because the army is in, in a really poor state. Uh, we, we have seen this in the Chechen wars, and we see it now. Uh, so he, he will continue, but maybe, maybe, and that's because I want to finish this, um, this statement with, uh, on a positive note, maybe there is somebody in his inner circle who can resolve the problem. And uh, whoever comes after him will have to distance himself from him because people will ask this. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe it's possible to do something with my, maybe, no? Maybe it's possible to do something with my micro. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, um, uh, Actually, I, I uh, very often think that it's, uh, in a way, Russia attacked not only Ukraine, but it's uh, attacked uh, it, itself. I mean, the, the, the majority of people attacks some minority. And I also have so many uh, friends and even relatives which uh, sit in Russia and also crying. Just crying, they, they feel themselves like in a prison. And they, they are not bombing, but it's, uh, the, the situation is also rather awful. And let us not forget about these people. There are also millions of, millions of people, actually. Uh, but I think it's, it's time to give the floor to somebody from this side, uh, maybe Carolina, yeah? Yes, I will be brief. It's very late, and I have been sitting here and reflecting on uh, a, a certain theater that was many decades active in Poland. It was a theater of Grotowski. And Grotowski was uh, famous because of his uh, controversial methods of working with actors. One of his methods was to push the actors to the limit of tiredness. And then he said, eventually, something comes out of them. So I do hope that something relevant and valuable is still coming out of us. Uh, now, quickly to the question. Uh, I wanted to, to ask Maxim a question about the generational change, because, um, yes, everybody is looking for a way to, to point at a, a possible beginning of a change. And I do believe that generational aspects are very, very important. 
But then when, when we come back to reflect on the atrocities uh, that are being done to Ukraine, we see atrocities and we see rapes. And those things, those deeds, are committed by very young men, even boys. So could you please reflect, could you please comment on this fact, how, um, how this will affect Russia, Russian society, and how then does it connect with your argument about the gener generational change? Why am I asking? Uh, I, I keep thinking when I see those pictures about one of the beautiful essays of Emina, uh, Emmanuel Levinas about forgiveness and guilt. And he says at one point that evil destroys, of course, the victim, but it also des destroys the perpetrator. And to put it in a social way, not only psychological or philosophical way, it also de degenerates the whole society. And somehow I think it is all also meant to be so. But um, I'm just wondering how, how will you comment on the generational change as a source of hope, and at the same time, long-term consequences of how, how this is changing Russian society? Maxim? I don't know. OK. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, uh, well, well. First of all, <clears throat> believe me, it's it's hard to be Russian uh, these days, and uh, <clears throat> I mean seriously. Uh, um, and having watched all those the same pictures, <clears throat> well, um, uh, Russia is notorious for not being able to uh, to go through this generational change. <clears throat> we go through uh, something you could call um, going down to zero, zeroing. Um, we had this in 1917. We had this over the collectivization effort. When people, almost like most people in this entire society would lose basically everything. <clears throat> then Second World War, 19, 91, 92, when all the savings, all the careers, everything's been wiped out, wiped uh, out overnight, and then we we started building anew. We are closing, I think, perhaps to a similar event, which will wipe out many people's savings, their uh, careers, their something they were thinking about the future because the, the people who are in power failed to create a mechanism of a peaceful transmission of power and uh, property in Russia. They failed. They used all kinds of things, for example, many oligarchs, which is, by the way, the reason why they could be targeted by um, Europeans and the West in general, because they keep their savings and assets. Uh, outside of Russia uh, uh, in Western jurisdictions exactly for that reason, because Russia itself, because of Putin and his henchmen, failed to create uh, institutions capable of preserving uh, assets inside the country. So they made, they themselves with their own hands made themselves vulnerable to outside pressure. Somehow they thought that would work out for them. Well. Anyway, so this generational change is difficult, and I somehow, in my mind, connect this war with this inability of the current leaders to peacefully give up their power. And, and in the next generation, which is essentially basically people of my age, um, I'm not even saying that Navalny necessarily had to become the next president, but we, we do have some other uh, political figures, but essentially it's uh, this inability and fear and imp uh, of the next generation that is, uh, uh, un is underwriting, as it were, this, this war. And to your question uh, exactly about these, these uh, very young people, many of whom were born in 2000s, they are 19, 20, it's incredible. Uh, they come from th these parts of society, uh, Russia's, big Russia's society. The, they had no education, very poor backgrounds. N none of this is to apologize for them. No, nothing, this is, there's no um, 
there's no way this could be pardoned in any way. They are war criminals, just like the generals who are sending them. And the one question remains that we don't know an answer to is to what extent Putin himself is uh, leading this operation. Some people say that he is essentially one of the generals, and which, in which case he is personally responsible not just for the war itself, but also for the terrible atrocities and war crimes and uh, unseen uh, terrible things that um, my countrymen are doing in uh, Ukraine. So this part of the generation uh, will spoil the life of their peers and uh, when they eventually, hopefully, come back home, they will be damaged forever. And yes, they will damage the environment around them. Still, a generational change has to happen, and it will happen anyway. And the question is, what kind of generational change? Will, will, it, will it be from the, the Putin's, you know, older Putin's henchman to a younger Putin, his you know, son or daughter? Uh, or still, there is a chance for um, others to come to power, and that, I, I'm afraid, will only be possible through a new event that would be a sort of a zeroing, going down to zero uh, uh, again. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, actually, I will give the floor to everybody, but we have, a, to my mind, a special guest for, for today's discussion is Christo Grozev, uh, which I'm a big fan of. Yes. Yeah. And uh, please tell us Everybody. everything about a, a few our country. Are allowing me to jump the queue because of my birthday, which is not fair, but uh, mm -hmm. I'll be very quick. I just want to um, express a bit of a, a concern that w what I hear from many quarters, except maybe from you, is a sort of a fatalistic view on, on Russia uh, in, in that it has always been like that. and, and uh, uh, it has always, uh, it has never had uh, mechanisms to defense, defend population against the state, um, and, and so on and so forth. Whereas, uh, what seems to be, uh, to me, the case is that it's all um, a, a function. It has all been the function of, of events um, and of the weakness of the rest of the world that has enabled um, Russia's historically totalitarian regimes to survive, and it does not have to be always the same. Um, when we were at a meeting, I think last year, with uh, some very, very renowned Russian journalists, uh, Maxim, they, um, somebody made a very interesting statement, and they're saying, we're trying to tell people the truth, and they are probably getting the truth, but whether they will vote differently than they have until now, uh, or whether they will want to vote, is a function of whether um, whether the fear of repressions is weaker or stronger than, uh, than their ability to live a comfortable life without actually going out to the street, without going and, and, and upsetting government. And uh, at that time, a year ago, it seemed like the comfortable life that the average Russian had was sufficient to never allow them to protest. But that has changed completely now, completely. Um, and uh, the cost that has been imposed on, on the people through the war will change that, uh, that calculus completely, there's no question. It has changed it completely for the uh, elite who have lost 80% um, uh, of their wealth and 100% uh, and of their lifestyle, which is very important, and the same slowly seeping in through society. So the calculus is changing, and my, my challenge, my question is why do we assume that um, the one uh, pony show that Putin learned to navigate over the last 23 years can survive in a new environment that he has never navigated until now. He did run a professional operation where he allowed, or he was advised to allow, a relative bubble of freedom of speech, of liberal, uh, a liberal bubble that lived its own life, which didn't mingle, didn't have to confront the majority of the population that was illiberal. But that is now no longer allowed. That is not there. So we, we see an exodus, but we, we, a lot of people cannot leave. So they will be exploding um, within, within, within Russia. So why do we assume that this has to continue when we haven't seen Putin navigate in a situation like this before? Thank you. So Slavomir, please. 
Um, thank you. Let me just say a word that I am also, like you connected to Moscow School of Political Thinking, like Maxim, I see some other, our friends, Kirill Rogov. I need to say this because I have a question actually to you. I mean, uh, well, actually to anybody because you, you were repeating and mentioning that the millions of Russians abroad, um, somebody said that there is a big Russian cloud Somebody emphasized that it's a creative class. Where are they? Oh, you mean? Because it's, it's a number like equal to Ukrainians. I'm, I'm seeing their, them every day on demonstrations. I'm seeing Belarusians. I'm seeing other nations. Where are Russians? You mean? And my, my question actually is, um, let me make it precise. Up to now, there was no Russian emigration that would be both democratic and anti-imperialist. And let me elaborate on two cases. Um, actually, I have a big hope that now it's, it's different. And I'm talking a, a lot with my friends, with people who are here, with Masha Guess and with others. And there is a good chance that now we have a breakthrough, actually, in this history of Russians in, in exile. But two cases are interesting. One is Polish, I'm sorry. I mean, um, because it's also, we have also the story of losing imperialist illusions. We were never empire like Russia, mm -hmm. but I think, but, but, but at least we thought that we were. Mm -hmm. um, up to recently, actually, after the Second World War, as Russians used to say, Krim Nash, the Crimea mm -hmm. is our, we used to say Lviv and Vilnius is our. Okay. And the mainstream of, of Polish immigration went to London. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were like, I mean, they were talking about Lviv and Vilnius all the time. And if you would tell them, listen, accept the borders, they will call you traitor and you will be completely dead uh, in London. Um, then, and then slowly, very slowly, a, a tiny, tiny part, and a number, maybe a dozen, not much more, Polish emigrés were in Paris, in Moison Lafitte, uh, around the magazine called Culture. And what they, what, what kind of a trade-off they proposed was, let's accept eventually, ultimately, the borders in this grain, terrible, very risky zone between Russia and Germany. Mm -hmm. Let's start to cooperate, to acknowledge, actually to, in, to, to integrate with Ukrainians, Belarusians, even Russians. Um, and let's um, and, and, and let's give us a chance to, to have independence. This doctrine, which is called ULB, there will be no independent Poland without independent Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania. Even for the most nationalist, populist government that we have now, is one is point mm -hmm. number one in the foreign policy doctrine. Um, I would, I mean, as I said, it's a Polish. If it would be Bulgarian or something analogical, it would be easier for me to say, I wish the same for Russians, but I, this is what I wish. The second case, much shorter, uh, is to show you precisely the difference um, between, for example, Navalny, as far as I know, and Boris Nemtsov, who is an absolutely positive person, as we know. Boris Nemtsov has an obsession about Ukraine. He was in Maidan. I saw him there. Um, he was constantly talking that he wishes Russia to follow the path of Ukraine. It's a very, very risky assumption that was behind it that Russia is like Ukraine, uh, or can be. There was no assumption that they are, these are two completely different countries, two different nations, two different political cultures, and there is no reason to think that you can have Maidan in Moscow or that, you can, that Russia can or should or this is the most natural way to follow the Ukrainian way. So be careful also about this case. This is actually what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. But it was a question to me or to... Can be to you. Uh, uh, because, you know, I cannot answer for the millions of people. Uh, I think that among them uh, there are a lot of people which uh, are mostly they against war and uh, they 
I can see the Ukraine an independent and uh, country, uh, but I, I, I can say tell only about myself because in even in 2014, uh, when, the, when um, annexation of Crimea happened, uh, I am as an editor in chief of journal Theater. We um, made a special issue devoted to Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian theater, and uh, this is this cover of this journal was uh, colored in. Ukrainian um, as, as an Ukrainian banner, which just believe me was uh, mm, practically crazy action that time, and uh, uh, I, I don't know how mm, not me personally, of course, but how uh, uh, the, the journal just survived all, all these things that happened then. Uh, um, maybe it, the question is why these uh, millions of people are keeping silent but uh, not all of them, and uh, just imagine, they are, they, um, they are also refugees. They, they are trying, I think, to solve these very uh, simple everyday problems. Uh, and they're scattered uh, all over the world. I mean, uh, uh, um, again, I cannot answer for all of them. I can answer all about myself. Uh, I'm trying to be honest, and I uh, make very, um, very own statements of the time. Uh, but maybe Max Maxim can add something to... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll briefly uh, answer to you, Christo. Uh, well, I'm saying this because I'm Russian and uh, because things you are saying are too, too good to be true. Um, uh, I have some... I mean, I, I, I trust that you, you, you see that in on all those um, sources you have. I hear not just that, but also other things coming from, for example, uh, uh, some uh, acquaintance of mine recently <clears throat> left Russia. He worked at one of the biggest state-owned companies, and he was telling me what his colleagues, former colleagues who stayed, uh, how they were talking about seeing this situation. He said that he, he knew not a single person who would be sincerely <clears throat> pro-war. They all hated that. But what they, they, they all realized that there was a terrible mistake. Um, but they all basically said that uh, it won't make any sense to leave right now because uh, it's unclear whether we'll be able to keep uh, the money. We will lose a lot, maybe lose some of it. But even if we get you know some of the some of the money somehow in in Europe or somewhere, we will be sort of second class kind of citizens. It's unclear. The future is unclear. Career is unclear. And uh, but on the other hand, all the fancy cars, nice lifestyle is still there for them in Russia. Yes, this is all crazy. It's a crisis. But they rather stay. And they were saying things like, "We will." It's better to fight because it's, it's becoming a fight even for us despite we hate it. It's kind of it's strange, but that's what he said. I'm not sure, obviously, that, this is, that many people do this. This particularly is about this one of the biggest companies uh, in, uh, in Russia. So it's kind of unclear which way the scales fall. So don't you want to, uh, to answer to Slavomir's questions now? Maxim, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't want to answer Slavomir's uh, question, yeah? Yeah, we're, uh, yeah um, well, yes, we're, Russians are terrible at uh, organizing anything or uh, creating networks, diasporas. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, I just have to say, it's hard. I mean, I'm, I'm part of a couple initiatives. There's some something called the True Russia Foundation based in London. It's been pain trying to organize and to come to uh, agreement on many basically practical, technical. It's working. It's raising money uh, for Ukraine, for the Ukrainians. Uh, it's foolproof. It's working. Uh, but it's, it's hard because there's no tradition. It's, it started in, in Russia proper. For the past maybe 15 years, we had a 
real, real growth of civil society organizations of various kinds, which essentially we never had before. Uh, all kinds of charities, foundations, uh, protest movements of various kinds, but not necessarily. Also, uh, environment protection. So lots and lots of stuff been happening. All of this has been completely killed uh, by now. But um, many of those people, they left. But um, it's, it's hard to connect it because apparently it's, maybe again you need a new generation, I don't know. Uh, but we, we don't have this. It's, it's, it's a painful question for myself. I, I, I can see what Poles can do. I see what the Ukrainians, uh, you know, talking about learning from the Ukrainians. Um, all kinds of people can do it. It's hard. Maybe we need, you know, to start a special school to how to teach ourselves to yeah. connect to each other, create networks, organizations civil society outside of Russia. So that's true. I'm sorry. Florence, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm not a Russia expert by any means. Um, I want to address this question, what will the future be for Russia from the perspective of, uh, of the EU? And uh, particularly the assumptions that we have about Russia. I've been a student and practitioner of um, peacemaking and uh, security and conflict analysis for over 15 years. And um, during that period, the way that I was looking at Russia, what I was learning about Russia was that particularly Putin was a wannabe, em wannabe emperor who was punching above his weight. And we were looking essentially at Russia from a perspective of just an actor that didn't really have any strategy in place. And that was attempting to use disruption very often without necessarily succeeding its, in, its, in its sort of vision. And it has sort of tainted also the way in which we, we look at Russia today. And we saw it at the very beginning of the war, when three days after the beginning, when Kyiv hadn't fallen, and we were very relieved, we started sort of you know, looking at Russian actions almost with a sense of humor, how Ukrainians were managing to steal um, Russian tanks, and essentially it was the story of David and Goliath. Goliath, sorry. And then something else happened. Bucha happened. Mariupol happened. A lot of different um, disasters, monstrous actions um, were on the way. And it leads me to keep on questioning essentially the way in which we look at this question also because I've heard today, you know, like that Russia is one of the losers. I think that we don't know that yet. And the reason why we don't know that is also because as Ivan was saying, we need to sort of look at the way in which Putin and the Kremlin are conceptualizing of Russia and, and give credit, essentially, to their strategies. And Maxime, you were saying, cite me one thing that Putin has done right. Well, the ruble is still stable. Putin has managed to build up, essentially, some fiscal reserves and has managed to preempt some EU reactions that we were going to unleash on him and Russia is still standing, and the people who are f suffering from the sanction system are the Russian people, not the Kremlin, not Putin per se. And then we're also seeing essentially a Kremlin which is in possession of a lot of different food reserves at the moment and able to wreak a lot of havoc on food markets and on prices. So my understanding at this point of Russia not being an expert and sort of looking at the way in which it is positioning itself in global markets and global relations is how are we understanding indeed, how much are we understanding Russian strategies, the fact that it is able to pivot 
towards Asia. The fact that it has been successful over the last six or seven years at creating some very strong partnerships with African countries. The fact that it is also very active in Latin and Central America and that it has managed essentially to position itself as a, as a power broker in a lot of different ways, investing very little sort of, you know, means or, or massive resources into its capacity for disruption, but managing to reach very high levels for disruption. So I suppose what I want to say is when we look at this question, what will the future be for Russia? We need to make sure that we check on our own assumptions and preconceptualizations within the way in which we look at Russia going forward. And that we ask indeed, as I was mentioning in, la in the last session, what are we missing? And why are we missing it? Thank you. I, 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 actually, I was very much provoked by Slavomir's question, so I, I, I will try to, to, to answer, not to answer, it's impossible for me to answer, but to, 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 to underline a bit this difference between uh, Poland and Russia, because it, what, Pol uh, what is Poland? It's, uh, Poland is Polish people, like 96% of Polish people live in, in, in Poland, but what is, uh, what is Russia? It's like Chechen people, Yakutia, Tat Tatarstan, so everything is, is, is Russia. And can you imagine such a absolutely crazy picture when like, Burat people are killing Russian-speaking uh, people in Ukraine, defending Russian world? You know, it's a very crazy situation we, we, which we are absorbing uh, right now. And uh, it's a really very important question for me, why for these people which are uh, ethnically are not Russian, they, it's, it's this uh, Russian uh, mythos about uh, this uh, world is so attractive. Why, why this mythologization reality is so attractive to, to people? It's, it's maybe it's the, the most crucial question of uh, nowadays reality. And I, I have no answers, but uh, let us just ask ourselves uh, why it's going on. So, yep, yeah, uh, um, first is Heather. And Thank then, you. And then we have not so much time, so. Yes, thank, thank you for this very illuminating discussion about um, Russia beyond the geopolitical questions. Yeah. Um, it's really healthy and important to have this debate here. So I think Esther and Ivm have done a fantastic job of bringing in culture, society, these things that kind of get forgotten in, in all of the pol policy discussions. But I would like to ask two questions about what happens to Russian society and two, also culture, which is perhaps one of the most stable elements, actually, mm -hmm. of, of Russia um, over all of the political turbulence and economic turbulence, the, the fact that Russia has, has, has such a strong cultural tradition that continues to evolve and be innovative and creative and so on. But there are two very big changes coming in the medium term, not the, not the long term, really the medium term. One is the pivot to Asia because that's where Russia's markets are going to be. Within a few years, Russia will have built the pipelines to carry the gas to China and Asia, and the, the oil is already being sent there. Yeah. Um, and that is sure to affect Russian culture and society too, because um, it, it means um, more commerce. It means looking east more than west. It means more commerce there. It means potentially more Asians also involved in Russian politics and the Russian economy, uh, particularly Chinese. So what, what kind of effect do you think this might have? And the second question is what happens as Russia's um, territory is really, really affected by climate change? Because the melting of the permafrost will have really big effects on parts of Russia which have been on the periphery, mm -hmm. which have been more marginal, and which will become the more economically viable parts. Whereas other parts that have been historically really important, um, they're going to, there's going to be desertification. So this kind of reshaping of where the population lives, of where the Russian people are physically, this will also have an impact. And uh, I'm curious as to, as to whether you can give us some clues. Thank you. Oh, 
So many, uh, actually, there's only 10 minutes left and so many interesting questions. And uh, I hope, Stefan, you, uh, you're going to, to, I wanted to, to make, uh, say something. I, and maybe you will answer some no, questions. No, no? no there was, I think something was skipped over in Slavic's question, I believe. Because the analogy with Poles in London who would not accept Polish and, uh, shrunken borders, I think the implication was that part of the problem maybe with Russians is that they don't agree that Ukraine is a separate country. Is that it? Or, and that's, that's one of the issues, even though I think if you look at the diaspora today, I'd be surprised if this was some very strong feeling that, that uh, Ukraine doesn't, that the border between Ukraine and Russia doesn't exist. So could you address that, uh, Max? I mean, what, in what way is the maybe traditional doubts of the independence of Ukraine within Russia, is that reflected in some kind of, well, whatever you are describing, the quietism, the inability of the Russian diaspora to speak loudly about what's happening? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, well, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I hope we are learning um, and, and progressing in terms of trying to organize there were really, literally, uh, very little experience for organizing NGOs in, in initiatives of various kinds, kinds, especially outside Russia, because it's a new environment for many. People just don't know how to do things. Anyway, so this is, uh, I hope it's, we'll, we'll do more of that. And, and now, I mean, for the past three months, just three months, being optimistic, finally, actually. Uh, yeah, so just three months, and, and we have lots of new or initiatives established, helping Ukrainians, uh, refugees, and Russians, because many Russians do need help. Uh, p people who are journalists, activists, uh, scientists, scholars, people who lost their jobs, uh, lots of them, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, so there are new initiatives that are looking at these things, and it's and it's working. So that, uh, it's 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 working. Uh, so this is an optimistic note, and in it, none of this. Ex so the, the lots of Russians actually are doing things. Maybe they're not heard enough, and or don't know how to make themselves heard, but a lot lots of initiatives are there. It's, it's maybe it's a, it's a function of current media situation in the West, because all attention is obviously and should go to Ukraine and Ukrainians. So what Russians are doing is sort of kind of not that visible, but it it is uh, it's going on. It's it's happening, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see uh, more of that. <clears throat> sort of one uh, kind of a less optimistic note, as, as I said, that many had to become journalists, essentially media people, instead of being, uh, you know, doing real stuff in the real world. And <clears throat> one last optimistic note is, is just, I, I, I still think that Putin is unable to do anything. And uh, he failed in every single big initiative that he had. Um, and he just manages to go on and pretend that nothing happened. And somehow he's been, before at least, it served him well. And so um, hopefully he'll also fail in uh, entrenching Russia as an, Im as an imperial power in this sort of pseudo ideological Z kind of campaign that nobody understands what is and so uh, this is this is my kind of optimism I'm sorry because again as I said I, and I hope uh, Hristo is right uh, he's Bulgarian uh, he, he sees you know he has the propensity for a more optimistic probably view of, uh, of the world I was born in Moscow and uh, uh, you know Russian culture is my culture doom and gloom is uh, the environment we were sort of brought up in Dostoevsky, you know. Uh, so, uh, but let's hope it's all wrong and goes away uh, okay. with okay. the next generation. Mm. 
I'm sorry, but it's, it's really time to give the floor to the audience because uh, it's only five minutes left. Yeah, so uh, I hope that your statements and your questions will be rather short. So, Sergey, from the first row, we, we will start from the first row. Yes. Hello, my, my name is Sergey Drezhnin, uh, concert pianist and composer living in Vienna. I just wanted to quickly raise a very, very important question that has to be solved really in, next, in, in the coming future. <sighs> Let's say the war will, in this and that form, go for a long time. That means um, Russia will need more soldiers. That means that um, partial or general mobilization is almost inevitable. It is looming. And tens of thousands Russian men from whatever, 20 to 50, they're fleeing Russian, they fled. Those who landed in Armenia, Georgia, or Turkey are fine because they've been given work permit and living permit, whatever, a residence permit. In European Union, residence. these people who actually fled, who lost everything, a lot of them are clever IT specialists, and there were those who will be drafted and will operate drones. As we know, the, the same is quote for, for, yeah. from, from, from one Ukrainian operator. You know, it, it's just like, like playing computer games. That's what they're going to be forced to do. And Putin has means to force them to do, because they all have families. You know, it's brutal, but it's true. So these people fled tens, tens of thousands potential soldiers to go and shoot their Russian or Ukrainian-speaking brothers. European Union give them they kind of hate them because Ukrainians don't, don't like them. So they, they cannot open bank account and they cannot stay here beyond 90 days. This question sh should be addressed. They don't pretend to be refugees because they're dreaming of coming back to their, back to their country, back to their life after this kind of will, will stabilize. I don't know to whom to address yeah. probably Human Rights Watch, but please be aware of this fact. We are many, they are many, but they have no right and they hate it here. Thank you, thank you. So please, uh, the first row and then you. It's only two minutes, so Yes, and please. it's actually not a question, Time but limits. an appeal because I, uh, I'm Hedwig Morway from the Erste Foundation and I am a failed change maker from the Balkans. And that may, gives me the right to say that uh, achieving a different type of future, a better future, will not be an easy task. And actually, I want to kind of voice an appeal to really search for all entry points in supporting those in the society, if it needs a generational change, yes, but also it needs all kinds of massive support to those potential islands where these change makers can develop and also to build constituencies in the society because this is going to be a long-term process and not to make it reversible, which made me leave my own country, Serbia. There has to be a massive investment and I really find it a bit pity that we didn't brainstorm enough on where are those entry points to achieve that kind of development within Russia, already starting from today. Okay. Thank you. Please, yeah. Hi, my name is Sonia, I'm from Ukraine, and I have two very short questions, one for Marina, one for Ivan. Mm -hmm. So you told us about millions of people uh, that are still in Russia and they're against the war, they're suffering really about it. I check, uh, I want to ask who, uh, who are these people, because I checked four years ago, Vladimir Putin, uh, he was elected uh, more than 76% of whole world. It's more than four, uh, 54 millions of people. They're also suffering now, just an interest. As Sergei Dovlatov said, you know, uh, Stalin, sure, he was a monster, but who wrote three millions of denunciations? And second, uh, my second question for Ivan, I uh, want to ask you what it 
uh, will be happen with the territory of Russia after Vladimir Putin will die. Because for me, it's absolutely understandable that uh, till he's leave, the violence uh, will be here. So uh, if it will be a whole country like now, or it will uh, divide on several parts, maybe Tatarstan separate, Chechnya separate, I don't know. Wait, so about knows. territory integrity, yeah. Uh, actually, it's, uh, uh, time is over, and uh, you ask me a question which I, really I cannot answer. It's uh, like a homework. Uh, um, the thing is, uh, me personally, I cannot come back even to Russia because I, I most probably I'll be arrested there. So, um, you know, it's really, it's questions for the next session, next discussion, uh, which, and so we have to meet again to, to solve all these problems. Because it's, I mean, there are so many uh, problems around Russia, and not about, about future, but about uh, nowadays Russia. And um, uh, uh, I understand that a lot of people want to ask these painful questions, and uh, they think that uh, somebody from Russia can uh, uh, answer them, but it's, it's really not so easy. But the good thing is that uh, really we have a lot to think in the, f in the future and maybe we'll continue just uh, in the coolers, uh, but to, to, for, 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 for now it's the, the, the discussion is over. I'm really sorry. It's already Thank you, even more than... Thank you, Marina. One, two. Yeah. Can we have... So, Ivan. Thank you, Marina. Please... Please uh, give us two minutes to close the day. Uh, Ivan, you go first. Well, again, thanking uh, Marina for uh, really doing a great job, thanking the, the keynote speakers and the experts, but thank you above all to all of you, to your stamina, and to uh -huh. the great discussions, questions, and answers that we have had. I think we'll go back from this day uh, as a very special event. I think we felt how extraordinary this was to put something like this together. Uh, Boris will mention names and, mm -hmm. and people, but from the part and on behalf of the IWM, I think just this proves how this partnership in fact works and we were able to put that partnership on stage mm -hmm. beyond the daily work that we do in uh, thinking about Europe's futures, working for it, and actually defending those values and rights that we hold so dear and cherish. And I think that the people that we have assembled in the audience and around this table just proves that this is a worthy cause mm -hmm. and uh, well-used funds from the Erste Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, thank you, Ivan. <laughs> well, um, just, just for your information, we had more than 200 posts on social media today, reaching 90,000 people via Twitter, Instagram, and on other social media channels. That's enormous for such an event. And more than 500 people watched our live stream during the day, which is also That's a great terrific. number. Just so you know, uh, the whole day has been recorded and will be uploaded and shared with you. You can re-watch it uh, if, if you want. I want to thank Rolf and the social media team for having done such a good work. And Gerald, Gerald Radinger from the Erste Foundation. So now, uh, now give me, there are some people we really want to get on stage without whom we w wouldn't have been able to manage this in such a short time with such great uh, 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 participants here on stage. And I really also want to thank you because, you know, I, I think some of you we called three weeks ago, four weeks ago, <laughs> but it's, it happened and it worked. And this is a fantastic experience of a great network. And I think we are very powerful and we will be even more powerful in the future. We can change things. We will, we will. I want to especially uh, uh, name one person with whom we wouldn't have been able to organize this, and this is Desi. And I want you, Desi, to come on stage, please. And gleich the next one, yeah? Desi. <laughs> Why me? 
you. Why me? <laughs> because it's you. I'm one of many. It's you. No. no, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I'm not finished yet. Oh. You stay. Then uh, I, you know, I want to name some of the, some of the, uh, the team members in representation for all the others. Sorry for that. Marianne, come on, come here. Marianne, come out. Marianne, come here. Give me the. Denkt ihr mir die Blumen bitte? Ja, wunderbar. Marianne Schlöhl did a fantastic job. I want to mention Claudia and Emily. Claudia and Emily, where are you? Claudia and Emily. Okay, they hide, they hide. <laughs> I want to mention oh, where, Claudia, are. Claudia, Claudia. Claudia, come up here. I know how, how much work this was the last days. This is for you. <laughs> Claudia, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to mention uh, in the foundation team Elena Stelzig and Valerie Grabenwater, Maribel, Maribel Königer from the communications department, and of course Gerald, Gerald Radinger, where is he? Gerald, come raus. Gerald, we need you here. Gerald, nah. Oh my God. Okay, he doesn't want to come. <laughs> Sabine Altmann, Johannes Steiner, Mira Kraser, Hedwig. Hedwig, we have something for you. <laughs> yeah. Emily, 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 come here. Emily. Uh, Barbora, Barbora, are you here? I want to thank you very much for everything. Vera, Maya, and Sarah Hayes from the IWM, thank you for this great uh, cooperation. Dino Pazilic, Thomas Goiser, Bernard Afau, the APA uh, uh, team, which was responsible for the live stream, the directing team, Esel, our photographer, <laughs> the stage three team, Rolf Mistelbacher, and the social media team. Thank you all. We made it. Now, <laughs> even and myself, we are so thirsty that we will go first to get the first beer. You are now all invited for a get together for some food, food and, drinks. and drinks. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy. Bye. <laughs>